Kia ora koutou. Uh, thank you for uh, tuning in to this particular um, important and special discussion that I'm having today. Uh, normally I would be doing this in a live situation on Facebook uh, and sharing it with our Facebook uh, community, but um, this is a little bit of an um, extraordinary occurrence with um, the events that we've had going on here in my hometown of Napier, uh, Hawke's Bay, and further up the coast in Tairawhiti, and I do know that obviously Auckland is still going through some, um, some challenges at the moment with uh, weather events as well. So what we thought we'd do today is um, have a bit of a discussion around how we can support children to manage and work through some of the traumatic events we've seen over the past few weeks. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Sarah I. Ono and I'm the Chief Executive of Longworth Education. Longworth Education is a PD provider for schools. We are play advocates. We are passionate about making sure that children are supported to grow and develop in a healthy and developmentally appropriate way. So this is this is our, our passion and this is what we love to talk about um, in more happier and less traumatic times. I've asked my dear friend Kerry to come along and join me in this discussion today. Uh, Kerry is a play therapist based here in Hawke's Bay. Her company PlaySense is a uh, company that provides support for children uh, in a therapeutic way using play to make sense of their world and understand um, some of the feelings and, th and thoughts and things that are going on for them. And, um, and I'm really, really excited to have Kerry here to help uh, work through some of the things that that I know many families and, um, and schools and teachers and, and concerned adults will be thinking about uh, now and over the coming uh, months as we start to recover from Cyclone Gabriel. So thanks Kerry for joining me today. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and yeah, kia ora koutou to everybody. Um, we appreciate it's really challenging times um, at the moment and we are thinking of everybody who has been affected by the cyclone and um, yeah, I guess, you know, with, with our tamariki as an extra layer on top of that, navigating um, the process from here on to support them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's particularly challenging. So I'm hoping that today, from my perspective as a play therapist and also um, I have a background in teaching and a mother, we might be able to share some things, maybe hopefully a couple of takeaways for you that might be helpful um, in supporting children therapeutically. Thank you. And I reached out to you, Kerry, because um, I saw the weather report last night and I heard the rain on the roof and um, and I was in touch with some friends and I just thought, my goodness, here we go again. There's uh, heavy rain warnings in place for Hawke's Bay. As we, as we talked this afternoon, the rain's coming down. And I can only imagine for a start, if we want to start off with that, um, how the thought of more rain and potentially more surface flooding, even just the sound of rain right now for some of our children um, and their families might be adding to already a very full plate that they're managing at the moment. Have you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, like you, Sarah, um, when we caught up with each other briefly last night, I was the same lying there listening to the rain and just thinking about, um, you know, the anxiety that I could feel as an adult who... Um, you know, was not directly affected, but could feel that for others and just how that must feel um, for other adults in, in our community. But yeah, like you, just thinking um, of the children and what they must be wondering, particularly at bedtime, which is when we're trying to settle down for the evening and, and for them to have a good sleep. So, and I think um, up until this point, you know, if children haven't had an experience like this, a negative experience with the weather, you know, rain can be such a positive thing for them, getting outside and splashing around in puddles. And I was thinking about that as well, um, you know, with the mud, you know, mud can be so playful and rain can be so playful. So I guess, you know, the association um, with, with this weather may have, you know, in the last week, pretty much overnight has, has changed their views um, of, of what that is for them. Yeah, yeah, because normally it's, you know, we have squeals of delight and, you know, you can't hold kids back from water and mud when they get into the play in that way. I know that um, some parents that I've spoken to um, who have been um, hardest hit by the weather event here in Hawke's Bay um, are, have communicated that some of their children are now scared of the rain. Um, some of them don't want to take baths. Um, these are families who have seen the almighty power of water um, and their, their security of their home, their possessions, 
have been taken away by water. Um, and I'm just wondering, really, I don't, I don't see that this is an immediate thing that can be fixed. Um, but how do we help children slowly, I guess, come to firstly know they're safe when they hear the rain um, and be reassured that they're safe? Um, but also to how do we how do we help them reconnect with the elements in a more positive way? Yeah, like you said, Sarah, I think it is definitely going to take time for many, um, many children, depending on um, how they've been affected. But I'm, I'm hoping that if we can um, take their lead and do it in a gentle way, um, there is hope that they'll be able to reconnect with the things that they love um, in nature. Um, I can I, I would maybe suggest just, you know, start by staying close to home and then just getting outside with an umbrella and the gum boots and just taking it really slow. And that might be enough, mm. you know, at one time. Um, but just, you know, children take a lead a lot from us. Um, they'll be looking for the adult as the regulator. So for us, maybe to, to lead the way and for them to, um, you know, see that we're stepping out in our gumboots in a puddle or we're putting up, up an umbrella and taking those first steps out that might be a good starting point mm. there might be other children who want to be the ones to go out first and I think an invitation rather than saying we're going yeah. inviting your child look there's a little bit of rain outside what do you think should we go and should we go and feel it or should we go and mm. um, yeah, just take one step it might be one step out one step in and then building over time. But I think every child will be different and um, it all that's when it's going to come into the, just noticing what that child, you know, what they need um, and trying, and it might not even be going outside initially. Um, you know, it might be, I know having a bath is really challenging, but maybe just minimizing the size of that bath and starting with the basin and getting some playful things out in a sink or a bucket um, mm. when we can do that. So. Yeah, that's what I would I would suggest small steps, not forcing a bath because that could end up, you know, there, there might be more resistance then and more reluctance. Mm. Um, and so thinking of other ways that we could do this, if the, if the goal is that you need your child to wash, then how else could we do this? Could we just have a spaghetti sponge and wet a sponge, make it warm and, and have your bath that way initially, just mm. until they build up that trust because, um, yeah, it, it will, it's likely going to take a little bit of time. And, and, you know, using the bath in their togs, it doesn't have to be a, you know, a bath bath, does it? You know, but even just standing in there in their togs with some favourite toys. And, um, but, it, you know, you mentioned about noticing there and, and I wanted to talk a bit about um, the framework that we use when we're, I guess, watching children at play, whether it's during trauma or, or during happier times. Um, one of the things that we use is this, this process of notice, recognise and respond. And I wondered if that would be something that would really help parents and teachers and, and adults and kids' lives to simplify this. You know, I know, I know there's going to be a lot going on in people's heads right now and a lot to cope with. Um, and the worry of supporting your children um, will add to that, obviously. Um, so trying to keep it really simple. Um, you mentioned about taking their lead. And this is where noticing is really important, isn't it? And observing what children are trying to do or explore or communicate by their behavior and their play. Yeah, I was also thinking too, that example of the bath that you gave, mm. um, giving the child a sense of control. Like I know, depending on the age, we don't want them to fill their own bath if that's not safe. Um, but if it is, and you are there, you know, the water level went up quickly you know, to a high level. So if we could give that back to the child, if it is using the bath or the sink or what it is, give that control back to them for them to pour the water in and to a level that they feel comfortable with, you know, and then again, you know, while you're doing this, just noticing what's happening when they're doing that. Are they okay? You know, do they want to put a little bit more in? Mm -hmm. um, and that could be your way of responding, being available to support them with that next step when they're ready for it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, I was just thinking that that could be another way of, I've been in a situation where they've had no power. So looking for opportunities to give them back a sense of control. Mm -hmm. um, and that is a really good, using that framework, where, where we're actually you know, observing and noticing what, what it is that they're needing or what they're doing in their play um, and recognizing and responding will be a way for them to have that power. 
um, give them a sense of control. And with that, hopefully that will also reduce levels of anxiety because it's building their self-esteem and their ability to know what they need. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It is it is taking taking back some power, isn't it? And this is this is what play enables kids to do. We see this particularly in in socio-dramatic play, uh, when children play out things that are happening in, in their lives. We saw this particularly with COVID, um, children playing out, giving their teddies vaccinations, playing out, wearing masks, queuing, you know, signing in, um, all of those kinds of things that obviously were going on around them. Um, and so through their play, they were um, testing it out. They were wearing it, but they had control over it, right? And, and they got to say what the outcomes were and, and multiple different kinds of outcomes. Um, that they had control over in their play. I'm just wondering, with um, with the play that we might see from this as a result of this weather event, um, I, I know um, at times when I'm watching children play, they can seem in that dramatic play quite um, matter of fact. There's not the emotion. There's the mechanics of playing through things. And I can also see sometimes children get quite bossy with each other and, um, you know, say, this is how it's going to be. And, and as an adult watching that, um, who has also been impacted and is working through our own emotions, it can be quite triggering, can't it? Um, I, I had a friend share a photo last night of her son's creation where he had um, made a whole uh, a trailer, if you like, out of blocks and he put all the animals inside the trailer and said that that was to help the, the animals um, from the flood. Now, you know, that can be said very matter of fact, um, no emotion involved. Um, as adults, we think, my goodness, this is what my child's seen and, is, and, and I'm sad that they have experienced this and they're working through this as well as my own feelings behind that. So how do we, how do we sit in it for us, but also not influence, I guess, uh, what what kids are trying to work through in their own way as well. Yeah, I think that's a lovely example of problem solving. Um, you know, when he put the animals in there in the trailer, he obviously had in his mind that that was his way of taking action mm -hmm. and how he could help, which will, he will have seen a lot of with people in the community stepping in. And maybe he felt, you know, that was his way of contributing. He had his own role in, in play. And I think a lot, of the, a lot of the play that we will see, particularly as children come back together at school, there'll be some, there'll be parallel processing. So they will be having these conversations. There will probably be some heated discussions. Um, and as, as an adult, uh, supporting in the play, I mean, bringing in that, um, you know, the structure again of just not stepping in too soon, just being available um, to notice what's going on, listening for the language, um, and then, yeah, just the power of observing and, and, and when the time is right, that might be an opportunity then to respond with some support, whether it's that the social coaching that might be needed about perspective and how different people have experienced different things. And so they'll have different perspectives um, depending on where they've been, you know, and throughout um, this whole event. Um, and I think, I'm just thinking of an example that I had this week. There is a wonderful resource um, through the uh, council. Um, I hired it from the Hastings District Council. It's called Waka Te Karo, And it is a play trailer where you can um, borrow a whole lot of, best way to describe them, probably um, different shaped, kind of harder spongy um, Yeah, they're not really objects. They just, which is the awesome thing about them because they can be made into so many different different things but um I used those in a school on Monday Tuesday it was perfect time for the booking and I was really grateful we could still use them but a lot of the children once they they ran over to them and they knew exactly what they needed to do and we had all sorts of vehicles you know similar to the trailer that was built we had um we had walkers we had cars we had all sorts we had trucks we had helicopters so we had a whole lot of things going there there was no direction from me whatsoever but that for those children, that's what they were processing, I believe, from from the past week. And so there were very there were differences. And there was actually, we even had Splash Planet that was built, um, which I could see there, the connection, you know, they were making that connection to water. 
Um, and in their play, they were then, they got to a point where they were calling out for a manager. They needed a manager for Splash Planet because obviously there's some changes happening there. And so then they were doing some interviews for a manager. So the, the, the play was so different for every child, but they were processing. I think the best way to describe it would be that parallel processing. They were processing it and the, they were using the same equipment in different ways, but they were processing what they were doing in their, in their own way. And I think that, that to me, I think just trusting the process, mm. the children, they've got it. They'll know what they need to do if we can just give them a little bit of space to let them begin mm. and then step in, you know, when they need us. I think um, I noticed that on Monday and Tuesday anyway, I was very much not needed most of the time. Um, I was definitely the observer, but gosh, there was a lot to observe. Yeah, yeah, and and this is, this is what play is so powerful for, isn't it? And and I know I've, I've I've written about this and talked about this a lot. That that we have the wiring there to know how to to work through as kids what's going on and to explore it. And really, at the end of the day, um, as you say, we need time to be able to um, have that space to explore. Um, and and as adults, we need that time too. Um, and I'd imagine there are, are many families at the moment that haven't had the chance for that space because it's just been all go, um, you know, for, for 10 days now um, since they they were, many of them, airlifted out of their homes. Um, so time, time to observe as adults, time to connect with your kids. I know many families are, you know, now in the midst of trying to clean up their homes and salvage what they can and and. For a lot of our kids, that means that mum or dad are away or dad's helping cleaning up the neighbor's place and things like that. How important is it for our families to try and have that connection point at some time during the day um, to support our kids in processing all of this? I know it must be incredibly hard right now. There'll be so much that needs to be done um, in the way of you know family homes and clean up and community work. Um, and I do think even if it's, um, and I think it's Nathan McKay Wallace that talks about love bombing, even if you can find, you know, five minutes in your busy day just to take a break. Mm. And as part of that break, you know, that noticing what your child's doing and going and joining them, because chances are if you're, you know, busy um, cleaning up, um, cooking, whatever it is that you're doing, um, if your child isn't in that moment helping you it's likely they are playing and it'd probably be really interesting just to observe what it is they're playing with because that's something else that's gone through my mind in the last week we will have a lot of loose parts everywhere that children will probably be picking up and using for something in the form of play and the other thing that I noticed on Monday and Tuesday when I was um, in this particular school was the that deep belly laugh that came with the play and I found myself <laughs> joining in, even though I wasn't actually, you know, in that piece of play, but just hearing it, it was so contagious and such a gift. Um, and I thanked the children afterwards for that because I had such a lovely laugh and gosh, it made me feel good. Um, and so if we can, in our day, maybe, you know, in our busy days with the cleanup, just take that five minutes, mm. you might just find that your children, that could be their contribution as well to give you that laugh, um, that therapeutic yeah, that, that deep belly laugh that you probably right now don't think that you can find. Um, it's there. And, and again, it's trusting the process. Your children, as frustrating as they might be sometimes, especially during the cleanup, if they're not helping or they're in the way, um, they might just be the ones that can find that in you. Um, and it's amazing. It just, yeah. And and if and I know this from, from working with, with children who find it difficult to communicate what they need and let's face it many children don't have the ability to communicate exactly what it is that they need succinctly or clearly that's that's not developmentally where they are um but i I've, I've noticed that children who struggle even more so that comes out in behavior that can be seen to be annoying or um attention seeking um or disruptive or rude or so we might get some of those behaviors um, where, again, if we come back to notice, recognize, respond, it's about us stopping for a minute and going, hey, you know, my son's making this really annoying noise that it's getting right up my nose. 
um, or he's just demanding my attention all the time and it's driving me nuts, just for a moment taking a pause and thinking, I've, I've noticed this, let's recognize what it is that he's trying to communicate here. And maybe instead of saying, oi, you know, <laughs> cut it out, just saying, you know, what is, what is it you need from me at the moment? You know, do you need a hug? Um, do you need mum to stop for five minutes and just let's sit and have a drink together or, you know, just let's have a think about what that behavior is trying to communicate, right? And yeah. how, how we can respond. Because I'd imagine there'll be some trying behaviors at the moment. Yeah, definitely. And that, that's, I think, a great way to respond to that, that question that you gave, you know, what do you need from me? Do you just want me to see <laughs> that that's what you're doing? Or do you need me to do something um, in response? It made me think about, again, um, early on this week with the with the equipment we had out and I had a particular child there who had very, very little English, almost no English. And his he was there. Every time that equipment was there, he was out there. And so I was just, I was thinking again of, you know, for him, another barrier, he's inside, you know, he's been through this, but without the language to communicate to his peers, his teachers. So we don't get that opportunity to hear him share what he needs to share about his experiences, but he used that play equipment more than anyone else over those two days. Um, and yeah, there were some behaviors that were definitely trying to get attention, but I get it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's that was his way to communicate. If you haven't got the words and for children, you know, play is, that, that's their communication. And the, the, the things that they use are their words, you know, the toys are their words and plays their, their communication. So if we can, um, yeah, wherever possible, they might not have the words right now. And and I love, I've seen it several times now, but I love the reframing of attention seeking. You know, we, we see people say they're an attention seeker or they're trying to get my attention. To reframe that into connection seeking, I think is a much um, more palatable way of looking at some of that behavior and saying this child is is demanding my attention a lot at the moment because they're seeking connection and they're yes. seeking security. And so how can I give that to them in a way that um, is is more pro-social? You know, it's it's more acceptable that they know that if they want to connect with me, this is how we do it instead of what they're trying to do um, in a roundabout way. That's right. We, we possibly had maybe a, a two-minute connection mm. and then he was off. He, he had what he needed for that moment. He had made that connection. Um, and then he was back out there to play. Um, so yeah, definitely, I think. And once they, and, and hopefully in homes, you'll see that as well. You know, once once they've had that connection, they've got what they need for now, and then you know can carry on doing their own thing, and you can carry on doing what you need to do. Um, but I think even if it's just that five minutes, five minutes a day, if that's all that you can give at the moment, that's that would be a starting point where it's that undivided attempt attention connection um with the child doing what it, it is that they want to do so you might end up you know having I'm not sure washing machine pipes over your head is that's what I was like on Monday <laughs> you know as speakers yeah. um as headphones sorry um and whatever's around the environment really that but again it, it'll probably make you laugh <laughs> um, or at least smile because that's what you get from children. They're so creative. And um, I guess too, I'm just thinking about um, for some of our parents at home, you know, we've been using a little bit of jargon here at the moment related to play. So loose parts, when we talk about loose parts, these are, this is really junk play. This is stuff that aren't toys. Um, it's, it's resources that really have no purpose. It might just be some of your recycling that's hanging around. Um, obviously at the moment we're going to have things we're going to have a lot of junk around that might be um, unsafe for children to play with whether it's covered in blood um, debris or, or has broken um, but even pulling out the pots and pans if you're staying somewhere and there's some pots and pans or there's some containers or milk bottle lids or empty milk bottles you know children will be really resourceful in what they have um, to be able to invent with and use to support as props in their play. So um, please don't feel you have to have a heap of toys. Um, you certainly don't. Um, children will be quite ingenious with what they can get their hands on. And we've seen this a lot um, in play in refugees and in war-torn countries where there's just nothing. 
somehow children still find stuff and they still make do with what's available to play. So um, you don't need to be worrying about having expensive stuff around for them to, to have that play. I think too, provided it's safe, like you said, Sarah, um, you know, if they were to choose an interesting object that they had come across around the house as a result of the cleanup, that can also be quite, um, you know, a fun family game or introduction where you try and think of the different you know the different ways that you could use it so so I was just thinking of a can't think of the technical term right now but the bendy bit on the you know when you're putting two pipes together the join you know, yep. for, yeah, for, for, for someone it might be a telephone for someone else it might be a hat yeah. um, you know, for someone else it might be a hearing aid so just different ways of of um and, and again for the, the child to have the power to choose um, if, if you're comfortable to do that at home, if that's something that will work in your house, that could be, yeah, again, you don't need um, an already, you know, someone who's designed a toy. It can just be an object that can be so playful. Yeah, absolutely. I guess the one other thing I just wanted to ask about, because um, personally, and we've been supporting friends of ours who have lost uh, everything, as I'm sure many people will have been doing. But one of the things that was probably the most heartbreaking was the loss of pets um, and precious toys, teddies and so on. Um, and the grief that children might be experiencing. Um, for many, this might be the first time they've experienced death. Um, this, is, this is the gift of pets for children is to have that uh, experience of death and the understanding of the life cycle and all the rest. Um, but to add in a layer of trauma to this, where um, for, for many of our children, their pets were washed away, they still haven't found them. Um, how, do we, how do we have a conversation around that um, and help them process something that's, that's happened that's really sad and, and really heartbreaking? Yeah, it's a really tricky one. Um, and I don't know the answer. I think, again, it'll de depend on the individual. Um, on the child and and I think knowing if I mean if a child if the child it may come up through play you know that they might be processing you might notice that through their play that there might be um, you know they might be processing the death of a pet or a person or and and so being by their side and just listening I think to begin with and not feeling like you've got to say anything while they're processing, they'll probably do if they're if they doing the talking. And then in time, there are, um, you know, picture books are a great way for children to know that, you know, other people have experienced this, they're not alone. Um, and I'm just thinking of a book off the top of my head, which is The Invisible String. And it's about how we're connected, you know, even when we're not together, you know, when someone's passed away, you still have a connection. I was thinking, you know, particularly for people and for pets, but if there's a particular, um, something that's special that they had that they maybe used to, you know, for, say for, for an animal, if they've lost a pet and they had a favorite toy, the pet maybe had a favorite toy that they still have or they've been able to find, if they haven't been able to find find the pet itself, like for them to be able to hold on to that, you know, as, as a special object and it may be as a transitional object. I was just thinking, you know, for teachers, a lot of children might be coming to school at the moment with things that they don't normally bring. Um, and, and they will be transitional objects that are, that are connecting them, you know, through that invisible string, connecting them to home when they're having to, which would be really hard for a lot of children to actually even leaving home and leaving family um, to go to school or to go wherever they're going. So I think we just need to be more accepting mm. as well. Um, and, you know, we have a, we'll have a window of tolerance and so do the children. And that window might just need to get a little bit bigger for now, just so that we're more tolerant for those things that children actually just need for now. I know sometimes, you know, we say to kids, oh no, you can't bring your, <laughs> can't bring your toys in from home because we worry about them losing them. But I think this is a time where there's that flexibility. And also to people, you know, there might be something special, really special um, a connection, you know, it, it might be a piece of clothing that reminds a child of that person if they've lost somebody or, or if they're finding it hard leaving them during the day, you know, it could be a scarf or something that smells like them. Just, um, you know, I think un understanding and, and finding out a little bit more about why that's coming with them and 
and respecting mm. that that's what they need yeah. and that's okay. Yeah, and, and I think you're right, the respect aspect of it. I know that um, in, in assisting some friends with a cleanup, um, you know, you or, or anywhere with a cleanup at the moment, you can be holding on to people's things that you don't have a connection to they're not your things and you could even you know look at it and think why why is why are they keeping this or you know why is this child why is this so important it doesn't look important or it's ruined or but actually that's not your place to make that decision um it's special to someone and I guess our role as as supporting adults is to recognize that special connection and, and respect it as you say and, and allow that tolerance window to be a little bit bigger than what we would normally have. Mm. And Sarah, um, we talked a little bit about earlier too, about that that recognising, and that might not necessarily come from the parent. It might come from the teacher, or it might come from another community member who might be looking after the children. Um, and so, you know, in, in noticing that, you know, our responsibility, I think, would be to, you know, to give that, feedback that this is what we've noticed um and again uh, uh, thinking going back to that, that string you know that that's just connecting us all together and and making sure so that if we've noticed something that we think is really important to pass on to the parent and the child you know is okay for us to share that then we make sure that that gets back so that then they can respond if we haven't been able to respond I'm just thinking with a with a teacher's hat on right now if we haven't been able to respond during the school day how we would like to mm. um, then at least it gives the the parent the opportunity to follow up but also the child sees that you know they've got a team around them yeah yeah and and I know for many teachers heading back into school I know some schools in Hawke's Bay are still not open yet or or are opening in various different ways we're not sort of doing school as usual um, as you say, for teachers, this might be your way of supporting families that you know are coming back in um, who have been impacted by the floods. They might not have their homes or their possessions or they've lost loved ones or loved pets. Um, as you say, to be able to allow the space for children to play and for families who are, you know, busy with cleanups and and getting, you know, stuff out and, and they don't have time to sit and watch children's play right now. Our role as teachers could be to do that on their behalf and, as you say, communicate what we're seeing back to families for that moment of connection at home when, when adults have got the energy and time to do it. And children, they will remember this. This will be a big part of, um, you know, their history. And I know some schools do learning stories. And so, you know, if they're noticing in their play things that are coming up, this will be something that children can look back on and because some bits they will forget um, but but it's another way of giving them that chance to process um, what's gone on you know they might not want to keep them at some point <laughs> but until that they that, that's their choice um, yeah. but until they do that could be a way for them to to um, process and then to share you know what they've processed when the time's right they can share that with whoever they want to because sometimes when things happen that are traumatic um, you know, if we just carry on and we haven't had that time for processing, then it will need to be processed later on in yeah. life. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then when that happens, there might be a few gaps because we can't remember. And some of those details later on feel really important and we wished we'd remembered. Mm -hmm. So that could be another opportunity. Um, you know, if schools are writing learning stories for children. Anyway, that could be, you know, I, I would encourage that to be part of the learning stories because they'll have a lot that they'll be processed. They'll have a lot to say mm. and, and they'll probably want to look back on that as part of the healing process. Mm. And I guess really just to finish up that, you know, as we've been talking, the, you mentioned about the invisible string. The other resource that comes to mind as well as, and I can't remember the name of the book, but the bucket fillers book. Um, and I wonder if helping children and adults understand that for many of us our buckets are pretty empty right now there's a lot of buckets that are empty and excuse the analogy with buckets and I'm over buckets at the moment um <laughs> having used a lot in the last week um but that feeling of we're all running a bit on empty and we all have our own buckets and you know when when we go into the supermarket and someone bumps in front of us or you know when mum gets a bit teary 
um, you know, she's fishing out something that they've recovered from the house. You know, I think children can hang on to an understanding of a bucket, can't they? And go, oh, yeah, mum's mum's a bit sad. Her bucket's a bit low at the moment. Not necessarily that it's our job to fill mum's bucket, but to understand that mum's bucket is empty or my bucket's empty. I'm feeling sad at the moment and, and help hang on that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and then they have that choice too, if they do want to do something, you know, even if it is that, um, to find that object to, you know, to play a game um, or whatever it is that they that they can, you know, but again, it's a choice. Their bucket might be just as empty as well. So that might not be the choice they make. And, yeah. and that's okay too. There's something else. There's one other thing I just thought about too, that um, often when we... Um, we hug a child. I'm just thinking about when I used to pick up my own children, I would always pick them up and put them on my left hip. Yeah. And just thinking about that connection to the heart. Mm. And so because children will regulate, you know, they will look for an adult um, to regulate off or someone else in the room if they're feeling dysregulated. You know, if, if you're hugging Hugging's a great thing to be doing right now, you know. Um, and so if you are hugging your child, um, you know, bringing them to the left side of your body is a great way to regulate their heart as well. So if they are feeling escalated, um, just something, again, to to observe and notice. You probably, pro people probably do it automatically anyway, but that's a great regulator mm -hmm. because if you haven't got the words, you haven't got the energy, your heart's still beating and that will give your child or the child, whoever it is that's getting the hug, um, that, you know, that reassurance. I know on my first day back, you know, some schools have started back um, in different ways. And that's what I noticed that the children would run in for a hug. And it was quite interesting because they did, they went to, they obviously knew where the heart was <laughs> because that's the side they ran to for the hug. Yeah. doesn't always happen but it was just an observation again yeah. um so just something that you know that you can do if you haven't if the, you haven't got the energy to do some of the, the other things mm. and just remember the power of a hug right now too yeah, the therapeutic nature that of a hug be, that by because i know too there's an importance around predictability and consistency for kids and routines and things like that we know that kids need routine and and for many the, that's gone out the window at the moment but that might be the one consistent thing um, that you're able to to offer or the energy you're able to give right now is hey I've got to make sure we're, we're going to have our our heart hug you know um, you know for five minutes before bedtime because that's all I've got that's because my bucket's low um, but that's every night I'm going to have that or every morning before I go off to clean the house or you know help others I'm going to have my heart hug so that um, we've got that consistency back um, and predictability just for a little bit for our kids yeah any little things like that where it starts to they, they know that something's coming yep. each day something's going to be the same yeah I like that idea absolutely oh well, look thank you Kerry very much for your time and um and your wisdom and knowledge around this and I know that there'll be many families and and um schools and educators out there that um I'm I'm hoping this will be helpful for um just to to navigate over the next few weeks um I know for me personally it's still um, sinking in that we've had such a, a an extreme event, um, a natural disaster, um, and I know for many people they've talked about the similarities in terms of um, the impact that Christchurch earthquake had, um, and now what we're seeing um, as this weather event. I know slightly different events, but um, certainly similar experiences for people and and the trauma that comes from that. Um, I know there's lots of resources out there that came from. The Christchurch earthquake experience for many families and children so please look into that if you can um, and you were mentioning too I know we haven't got to it but um, Dr Lucy Holmes talk on resiliency as well um, on TED um, I managed to have a quick look at that and I thought that that was brilliant as well so this is what we're talking about is helping our kids be resilient through um, what effectively is life isn't it this is what life throws at us sometimes so how can we help them navigate that and there are there are quite a few, like you said, Sarah, quite a few resources out there that we sort of won't bombard everybody with right now. But I'm happy to add those um, to your, I guess your um, page is the best place, Sarah, where, where you put in the video um, to share those. There's just one last wee thing for me was this is another one of 
one of, another one of my favorite books. Yeah. And there, there is a page in here that I think is a good little reminder that says, uh, what is the bravest thing you've ever said? Ask the boy, help, mm -hmm. said the horse. Mm -hmm. And I think that we are doing that and, and keep doing that. Um, and I'm certainly available for help. Um, if there's anyone who, who who feels like they need a bit of extra support there with their children. Absolutely. And um, I'll post this video. Um, I'll put it up on YouTube and I'll post it onto our Facebook page and Instagram. And um, I'll put um, details there of some resources and, and Kerry will share some resources. Um, don't forget that there is mental health helplines out there as well for adults. Um, and I do know that, that there is recognition that that um, mental health will be something that um, is going to need some support for a little time um, when the, the physical um, aspects of this event have um, have been resolved. So um, we'll put all those connections there for you to reach out to as well. And as Kerry said, um, I'm available as well. Kerry's available if you do need uh, any help or have any questions. So um, thank you again, Kerry. And uh, let's hope this rain doesn't come to, to much at all. Let's hope it's going to keep the dust down a little bit. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for the opportunity. And we are thinking of you all. Thank you.